just keep an eye on on the not rushing, and it's not for Karina, it's for Karina, for Micah, for uh, Matenki, so for everyone, at least we are rushing a little bit, and and that's why we put this piece on every, or or Mozart uh, excerpts on, on orchestra auditions, because if you can keep a steady beat and not rushing, you're ready to be accepting that orchestra, just keep that in mind. But let's move forward, and by the way, um, Anika, I would ask you to play it live again, because the recording is on my uh, computer and I have no internet. I'm uh, actually using my phone. Do you mind just playing that live, uh, Anika? Uh -huh. I think you're still muted, Anika. But wait, before you start, sorry, can I just add one thing? Because May kind of inspired me, but I feel like just to clarify, I guess just talking about like where the most important beats, at least in classical music, I think generally downbeats are always going to be more important. So in three, it's always beat one and then two and three are lighter. So I guess like the really famous example is like in a waltz, right? You'd be like, it's always one, two, one, two, three. And so if you just think of a dance, that's like normally how you're gonna move to it. Like it'd be weird to do kind of a two. And I know, and this is just kind of in general for classical music. And then in um, like, if it's four, four, then it's beats one and three, because those are like the, the, the down beats of there. But then what kind of got me thinking about that is there's this concept of it's called rhythmic hypermeter that you can kind of extrapolate that information. And this gets into like intense theory and I'm totally not a theory guy, but it's really clear to see in Mozart. And I think it's actually really, really cool. So I'm gonna explain it in like one minute, probably very badly, but hopefully you guys can kind of follow. So remember we were talking about in a group, uh, a four, four beats one and three are more important. So you can kind of extrapolate in this, if we pretend each bar is a beat. So you have the, right at the leg row, it's bar one is beat one. And so there's a big chord, which we have a rest, but if you look at a score, the other instruments play the down beat. So this bar is more important than, mm, this is our bar two. So it kind of like builds upon itself because then you're taking each four bars and putting those into a bigger, sub bar and then you can take each bar of four and put those four bars into a group of 16 bars and it kind of just keeps expanding itself but this is a really great way you can kind of use to shape your musical guidelines because the first phrase is its own thing right but then we kind of have an answer to that so in the big hypermeter, this is beats one and two. And then it's like slightly related, but slightly different. We have to get two repetitions of something. And so if you kind of extrapolate that to bigger phrases, you can kind of see how Mozart kind of uses that. And I think that's really, really cool. So you can kind of think about that a little bit. I know it gets a little bit confusing, but it's a really kind of neat concept to then kind of you can break it down and then expand on it yeah okay thanks <laughs> Annika take it away
Great playing. Um, I think I'll just start with a couple things. Um, I think in general you really have a good idea of um, like phrasing and the sound of Mozart, uh, which I really liked. I think the rhythm could use a little, the rhythmic integrity of it could use a little bit of work. Um, so I think a lot of people today have had a problem or a little bit of a hiccup in their rhythm when it goes from the melodic to the 16th. So I'm looking at bar 54 into bar 57. Like that seems to be a, a, a little bit of a, a bump when we go from the bar lines. Um, so if you want to try bar 54 and play for like eight bars, what I really want you to think is inside, really try once where you think three. I know that we're thinking big bars, but I want you to actually think three inside, counting your head while you play. Um, so start from bar 54. Good. So some of those sixteenths aren't that even. For me, it's really important for sixteenths like that when you're supporting um, the melody line and the brass, for them to be really even, to be really spread out. Um, so it's really noticeable and it's actually really hard. So uh, if you ever play this in orchestra or maybe you have, I think the trumpet players would get so mad at you if you rushed that or did not give them exactly four notes to play hit their next beat. So if you're going, you know, if it's a little bit off, I think they're, you know, you don't want to make your, your teammates you know, have to look bad by playing in the wrong place, right? So you want to spread these really evenly. And so the way you do that is to really be in control of your right hand. So I, I want to do the same exercise with you where you play the G and just play four notes. And it's really important that up bows are just as, as strong as your down bows. So really think it through melodically, just four Gs. Play the rhythm and just play G 16th. What are you thinking during that while you're playing it? Um, I guess I'm trying to count. Sorry, say it again. I'm trying to count. Did you hear that, Andy? Say it again, closer yes. to the mic. Trying to count. Um, sorry, okay, maybe. what are you counting? Um, just every four sixteen notes. Good. I think what I would do is count quarter notes. So I think one, two, three, and then I think one and two and three, and then, sorry, that was bad. So I'm thinking one, two, three. For, for now, think downbeats, kind of like what Andy was saying. Think one, Two, three, one, two, three. Now just try the sixteenths like that. <laughs> 